open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. And I'll give you a few minutes to get there. Or well, I'll give you a few seconds to get there. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Maybe it's on your phone. Get your physical Bible open. And uh, now, if you're able, I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to play a little game this morning to begin. Thank you, Keith, for enthusiastically following the instructions here. Um, all right, standing together. Now, you're, you all look so spiritual. You got your Bibles open as, like we're going to... No, we're not... We're not doing that, actually. So just keep your finger where your Bible is. We're going to play a game. This is last man standing, okay? I'm going to ask you a question, and if you've done one of these things, then you're going to sit down. And don't worry, I'm not going to thoroughly embarrass you, all right? Okay, well, maybe I will. I don't know. We'll see. Okay, if you have intentionally exercised in the last three days, key word there being intentionally, then sit down. If you used conditioner on your hair this morning, then please sit down. If you've done some kind of manicuring process to your nails in the last three days, please sit down. <laughs> if you bought a new shirt in the last three days, please sit down. If you skipped a meal in the last three days, please sit down. If you could identify a specific ache in your body when you woke up this morning, please sit down. If you used a straight razor in the last three days, please sit down. If you've inserted contacts into your eyes, in the last three days, please sit down. And that's all the questions I have. You guys exhausted them all. Okay, so you're the winners of the game. There's no prize. <laughs> you got to stand last. That's basically what you got to do. So give them a round of applause. <clears throat> this is your 15 minutes of fame, I guess. I don't know. Every one of those questions had to do with something related to your body. It's fascinating to think about how many things about everyday life relate to your body. So as we just heard, things like exercise to make your body healthy, spending time getting dressed to make your body look modest, spending time grooming and brushing your hair and checking yourself out in the mirror to make sure that you're halfway presentable, eating food and drinking thinking about eating food and drinking, looking at other people's bodies and making judgments, too fat, too small, too skinny, too tall, looking at other people's bodies and admiring them or lusting, nursing injuries to your body, acutely aware of what's hurting in your body, what's broken, taking your inside thoughts and then putting them on the outside through words, through your tongue, putting your body in sleep mode every night so you can regain stamina. All of these things, drinking, eating, talking, swimming, flirting, healing, the vast majority of everyday life is consumed with some aspect of the human body. Spend today just observing yourself and you'll notice that most of what you think about has to do with how you feel or where you're going or what you're going to do with your body. And yet... People around the world and in our country believe that your body doesn't really matter and what you do with your body doesn't really matter to God. It's actually one of the great lies in our culture right now. It's my body. I own it. I get to do what I want with my body and no one gets to tell me what to do. And we have, this, we have this way of separating things that belong together. We compartmentalize our Christianity. We put spiritual things in a box over here, and we think that, you know, like church and topics like sin and forgiveness and guilt, they're over here. That's the spiritual stuff box over here. But then we have things like our bodies and what we eat and what we do 
And those things are over here and they don't really relate. They're not, they're not really together. They're not, they're not connected in any way. You know, what we think about God and what we think about our bodies don't really connect. Well, that's actually what's happening in this book in Corinthians. This is the, the culture that the Corinthians lived in. This is the air that they breathed. But that's not what God says in his words. God's really clear that his lordship, when we talk about God ruling and reigning and being over us, his lordship is over every area of life. All of life is under Christ. What you do with your body is as important as to what you do in your soul. And so Paul continues to teach as he's working his way through this book, as he's telling us this is the way of the cross. There's a worldly way of thinking, and then there's a cross-centered way of thinking where lives match your profession in Jesus. You don't just say that you're a Christian, but your life actually conforms to what it means to be a Christian in holiness. And now in chapter 6, he speaks about this incredibly relevant and very sensitive to us topic of the body and of sex and of resurrection and of worship. Here's the big idea for this morning, okay? We're going to see that our bodies are not just biological. They are deeply theological. Our bodies are not just biological. They are deeply theological. And to use other big church words, they are eschatological and they are doxological, which in plain English simply means your body is not insignificant. It is of tremendous significance to God. And it has tremendous significance for your future. And it has tremendous significance to worship. Worship is not just singing songs before a sermon at church. Worship is all of what you do with your life and who you bring it to worship. And so I want you to read along with me now in chapter 6 as we read this important and delicate passage, beginning in verse 12. Paul writes, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Notice the way that this passage ends. You are not your own, you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. That's where we're going to land. That's the place of true joy. And now we're going to see how do we get there? How do we get to this place? And we've got three things we're going to consider this morning. First, your body has tremendous significance. Your body has tremendous significance to God. Go back up to verse 12 if you could. And Paul, as he starts to deal with the, the worldview of the Corinthians, you'll notice that in verses 12 and 13 that there are quotes there. Do you see that in your Bible? In the ESV, there's quotes there. Now, there's not quotes there in the Greek, but there's good reason to think that these are actually quotes or statements or mottos that the Corinthians have written to Paul, and now that he's read their thinking, he's now quoting back to them, this is your worldview, and then he's going to talk about what it means to follow Christ. 
And so these quotes represent their beliefs and their convictions. And these quotes reveal that the Corinthians had a very dualistic worldview. They had this separation between body and soul. You might have heard the term Gnosticism. It was a name for this kind of thinking in those days. There there was this idea that the soul and the inward parts were spiritual and were important to God and the body didn't matter. And some would even say the body was evil. And and so there was this like separation between person and and inwardness and, and soul. And then what you did with your body, they didn't connect and they didn't relate. The, the, the body was thought of as just the shell that houses the soul. And they break it into two compartments. Christ has rights and authority over the soul to tell you how you should think, but the individual has the rights over their body. And we see this in their, in their mottos. Look at verse 12. First, they say, all things are lawful for me. All things are lawful for me. Another translation of this would be, I have the freedom to do whatever I want with my body. Or maybe to take it even further, I have the right, not just the freedom, the the ability, I have the right to do whatever I want with my body. Now think about, just think for a moment about our culture as you interact with that. This is the same, these are the same convictions that fueled and undergirded the sexual revolution of the 1960s. I have the right to do whatever I want with my body. Free love, casual sex, whatever you do with your body has no bearing on your soul. You can hook up with whoever you want to without any emotional consequence. In fact, the marker of the, in, in this way of thinking, the marker of the, of the sexually mature person becomes the person who can shut off the inward parts of their, of their self and have sex without commitment as often as they want and as much as they want with whoever they want. That's applauded because the body and soul are disconnected. So if that's the case, why should God care what you do with your body? Well, this mindset in the 1960s led to a widespread increase of premarital sex, an increase in adultery, and it laid the groundwork for where we sit today in our country for the gender revolution. I have the right to do whatever I want with my body, even if it means making myself from a biological male to a biological female or from a biological female to a biological male or I have the right to do whatever I want with my body even if it means killing the baby that's inside of me. Because that's just body. It's not soul. Or so they say. Ideas have consequences and these kinds of ideas have very serious consequences. We see their next motto in verse 13. Look at that. When they, in quotes, when he quotes back to them, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. This, this reflects their view, their conviction, that their bodies are strictly biological. They just, they're, just, they're just biological urges that need to be filled. This is likely another layer of defense that they're having as they're talking about sexual ethics. So not only do they have the freedom to do whatever they want with their bodies, not only do they have the right to do whatever they want with their bodies, but their bodies are strictly biological. So the logic is like this. Just as hunger is for food and food is for hunger, so should sexual desire be filled with sex. It's all biology. It's pleasure and pain. Maximize pleasure, minimize pain. Can you see why this would be relevant to us in our culture? Corinth is us. We are Corinth. This is the worldview of 21st century America. Data has been shown that data from 2017 puts the pornography industry at over a hundred billion dollars of net worth, with profits exceeding $10 billion a year. Sex without commitment is the same as the body without the soul. 
And so the hookup culture and the abortion culture and the prostitution culture and the sex trafficking culture and the pornography culture and the euthanasia culture can all be traced back to this kind of worldview. I can do what I want with my body. I have the right to do what I want with my body. The body is just biological. And here's where Paul says, this insanity stops. The body and the soul can't actually be separated. They were both made by God on purpose, and they were made to stay together. Paul now directly responds to their worldview with his own worldview, a gospel-informed worldview in verse 12 when he quotes, all things are lawful for me. Then he says, but not all things are, are helpful. You may think you have the rights to do whatever you want, but not, not all things will lead to flourishing. Not all things will lead to joy. Now, to be clear, he's not actually agreeing with them that all things are indeed lawful. He's not saying sinful things are indeed okay. He's simply using their words to help pastor them. He's saying if you think this way, then you have to add something to your thoughts. It's not enough to say it's lawful. Is it helpful? Is it actually producing joy to live in the opposite of God's design? God has built a design into this world's. You know, try running your car on Pepsi instead of on fuel for a week and just see how it goes. See if it's helpful. It's not. I don't know. I didn't actually try it. I'm guessing. Paul's grid here is not what is permissible, but what is helpful. What helps you see Christ more clearly? What helps others treasure Christ? Anything that helps others treasure Christ will also be lawful. But not all things are helpful. He continues, all things are lawful, but you got to add something else, Corinthians, but I will not be dominated by anything. Paul's insinuating that this freedom that the Corinthians are reveling in, like we can do whatever we want, that this freedom actually comes with it an enslaving power, and they don't even know it. That's why Paul Tripp often says, he's an author and a pastor, he often says, even a good thing becomes a bad thing when it becomes a ruling thing. Even a good thing becomes a bad thing. Even a lawful thing becomes a bad thing when it dominates you, when it becomes the thing you live for, when it becomes the thing you must have to be happy in this life. This unfettered freedom becomes slavery. If you put as much salt as you want on your food, you're like, you're going to have high blood pressure. And if you, like, go to the candy store and eat everything in it, you're going to probably have some diabetic problems. So the idea here is that God has made us to enjoy physical pleasure as a gift in its purest form, but we will not be mastered by it, and we will no longer live for physical pleasure, but for the Lord. He goes on to talk about food, verse 13. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. Then he says, here's what you're missing. And God will destroy both one and the other. This is a statement of judgment that's coming. God is bringing the world to an end. Do you guys know that? He's bringing the world to an end. He's bringing the physicalness of this world to, a, to an end, and then he's going to remake things. He will destroy the body. He will destroy food. All that you have physically is a temporary arrangement. Now, you might think that that would actually support their point, that the body is just biological, and so it's going to be broken and destroyed someday, so what difference does it make what I do with my body? If there's no accountability or if there's no eternal impact, why does it matter? I think so many millennials in our day are asking questions like that. Why does it matter? And here we learn the why. Here we learn the purpose. Continue reading. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. The body is not meant, there is a design. It's not meant, it's not intended to be used in that way. It's not intended to be used for sexual immorality, but it's intended to be used for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. So he's stepping way back and painting this big picture of God who is a creator of the body. God has created you. And the creator has rights over his creation. 
Just like an artist has rights over her paintings, there is a purpose for our lives simply because we were created. We're not accidents. The body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. So you can't do whatever you want. You don't have the freedom to do whatever you want. You don't have the right to do whatever you want. You owe your soul and body to the Lord who has rights over you, and that's a good thing. That is a beneficial thing. That's the way God designed it. That's the way that we flourish. And here's the kicker. Even when the body goes into the ground, it doesn't stay dead. He helps raise their eyes to the resurrection here in verse 14. God's going to destroy one and, and the other. And then he says, and God raised the Lord and he will also raise us up by his power. That's why I say the body is eschatological. Last times. You can't get rid of the body. You can't shake it off. It belongs to God forever, even after death. In the last days, your body will spring back to existence at the sound of God's voice. We will have resurrected bodies given to us by the Lord Jesus. And when we do, when this happens, Paul tells the same church in the other letter, 2 Corinthians, the follow-up letter, he tells them that we will give an account for what we did in these bodies. So listen, listen carefully to this. 2 Corinthians 5, he says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, all of us, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So your body is not just biological, it is deeply theological. Do you track with that? You're not free to do whatever you want. You've been created on purpose to glorify God. You do that both by your soul and by your body, working together to glorify a purposeful God. There's no dichotomy between the body and the person. Nancy Pearson, who wrote a book called Love Thy Body, an incredible book, deeply philosophical, might take you a little while to work through it, but very good, says this. In the, in the purpose-driven view of creation, there is no dichotomy between body and person. The two together form an integrated psychophysical unity. We respect and honor our bodies as part of the revelation of God's purpose in our, for our lives. It is part of the created order that is declaring the glory of God. So, Let's, let's abandon any kind of sort of pseudo-spiritual idea that like what you learn in your mind and what you study in the books is what's really spiritual. And you're in the Bible all the time and you're reading all the time and you're, you're eating it up and you're hungry and then you're going off and you're using your body to do immoral or wicked, sinful things that cannot be, should not be. This brings us to the heart of the problem in the church. Look at verse 15. Here's the problem he's trying to address. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Now, the second main idea I think that we find here is that not only does your body have tremendous significance to God, but your body is forever connected to God. Now, here's what's going on in this passage, and you you've kind of have to understand a little bit about the city of Corinth to get kind of what's behind this writing. This city, Corinth, is filled with rampant sexual immorality. It's just a part of the, part of the city. There, there especially was immorality that happened around the temple. There was a temple there dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love. It was located in Corinth. It was well-traveled. People would come to the religious services at the temple, and these temple services to the pagan god Aphrodite would involve sexual immorality. At one point in time, 
authors write that there were a thousand prostitutes at the temple on hand. And so, as hard as it might be to imagine, a stop off at the temple at the end of a long work week was as common for them as it might be for people in America to get to the end of the week and stop off at a bar. They're going to swing by the temple and have sex with one of the prostitutes on the way home. And this was common even for some of the believers. And Paul wants them to understand the radical way in which the gospel changes their participation in these sexually immoral practices of the world because of an even greater, deeper, truer, more longer-lasting joy that is in Jesus Christ. And so he speaks directly to this issue that's happening in their church. Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? Your body has been joined to Christ's body in some metaphysical sort of way, so that now you've become a body part, a member of Christ. And he's saying, shall I take the members of Christ and make them members with a prostitute? Shall I join Christ together with a prostitute? Never. You know, one of the things you need to get from this passage, you're going to see it again later on, is that, is that the way that God exhorts us to holy living is not just to tell us, don't do that, but do this. He doesn't just give us laws and rules. Yes, there are imperatives in this text, but he wants us to understand it's not enough to just tell them, stop going to the temple, you Christian. That's not what good Christians do. Don't sleep around. Be a good Christian. No, he wants to paint a picture that's far more significant than that. He's trying to help them see if your body belongs to God forever, if you've become a piece of God's body, then how much more significant is it that you would join Christ to a prostitute? In other words, you're not just defiling yourself if you're a Christian and you're engaging in sexual immorality. You are bringing the purity of the holy, holy, holy God into a powerful, defiling act. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? Then more theology here. For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Something powerful happens in sex by design. And of course, that design is meant to be a glue that helps support the commitments of marriage. And that's why, remarkably, he quotes in this passage, he quotes Genesis chapter 2, which is the Adam and Eve, God's instructions to them, first, first marriage, which he also quotes later on in Ephesians chapter 5, as he's describing the mystery of Christ and the church through this picture of marriage. He's saying that this, this two becoming one flesh, this is supposed to symbolize Christ and his church, which means, kind of practically, there's no such thing as casual sex. There's really no such things as, as friends with benefits or hooking up with no commitments. Your conscience tells you afterwards that it doesn't work that way. The very act of sex joins you together in a metaphysical sort of way that's meant to become increasingly whole, body, soul, life, together as one in a marriage. Parenthetical notation. I don't think he's arguing here that sexual immorality constitutes a marriage. I think he's using this as an analogy. It's analogous to it. And I'm not going to spend time here in the sermon unpacking that, but just we can talk later about the scriptural reasons for that. I think he's saying it's like a marriage. It's like what undergirds a marriage. It's supposed to be this glue that comes together, and it's significant. Verse 18 says it's so significant that it's kind of like no other sin in its impact. Uh, Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. It's a different kind of category. And what's his point here? 
His point is, you already belong to someone else if you're a believer. You're already one in spirit with someone else. You are one in spirit with the Lord. Look at, look at that verse as it says. It says in verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord, but, he, contrast, he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So which is it? Are you joined to the Lord, one with him, or are you joining yourself to, to someone else in, in immorality? And he's saying, if you've been, if you've been, if you are a Christian, you are betrothed to Christ. You are one with him. You are connected forever to God. This is the substance that the shadow of sex points forward to. This is the reality that shapes everything then about our sexual ethics. We are together for Christ. We are with him. We are connected in, in him. And that's supposed to be our fuel to fight sexual temptations and to center our affections on our spouse if we're married and to ultimately anticipate the worship of Jesus Christ, the one true God in heaven forever. That, all of this is all precursor to the actual imperative, which seems obvious now to us in verse 18 when he writes, flee from sexual immorality. That's it right there. There it is. Flee from sexual immorality. That's the imperative. Super simple. Run away. Well, I mean, he could have saved a lot of effort and time, right? All he had to do was just say that from the beginning. This sermon would have been a lot shorter. Why does he tell us all of this theology? Because the why is what gives us power for the what. The why is what gives us power to do the what. Flee sexual immorality. Okay. Why? Because you, have, you are of tremendous significance to God. He made you. He owns you. He's created you by design. He's drawing glory from your life. He commands us to flee from this, but it's not enough to just give us a checklist of good behaviors. He's after our hearts. He wants us to worship him and out of worship of our God, overflow into a life of holiness. In fact, that's why he, he, he turns his attention now in his final rationale for pursuing chastity to this idea of worship. So verse 18, the imperative, flee from sexual immorality. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So, because of that, glorify God in your body, which is the same thing in this context as saying flee sexual immorality, which is the same thing as saying that's what's most helpful. Your body is meant to worship. Your body is meant to worship God. This, this would have been absolutely, incredibly mind-blowing to the Jewish readers who understood way better than we do what it meant to go to the temple to worship, the temple being the place where God's presence dwelt. You, you, you had to go physically someplace to encounter that. God's presence is in the middle of his people at his temple. And then Jesus comes and says, I, I'm tabernacling, I'm, I'm dwelling among you as the temple, the place where God's presence is. But then Jesus goes away and he says this, he says, it's going to be better for you that I go than if I stay. Because if I go, I will send one to you who will be the helper, the Holy Spirit, one who is so near you don't have to make a Mecca to the temple. One who is so near and so close and so intimate with you that he has taken up residence inside of your very body. It's an intimacy that puts to shame anything that took place in the temple of Aphrodite. God is with us and God is in us. I mean... Can you even begin to get your mind around that if you're a believer? God, the creator, is inside of you working out God's 
plan for your sanctification and your holiness and your delight. And Paul says, you didn't get this spirit because of your obedience or because of your sexual morality. No, you got this spirit because God gave him to you. And you, were, you, you could not have been given this spirit unless God had first purchased you. He says here that he bought us with a price. This has the idea of like a dowry payment. And in those days, you'd have to give a payment of some kind in order to enter into a marriage. Well, this dowry payment that God makes is an incomparably beautiful dowry. It is the precious life of Jesus who, listen, listen and think about what we're talking about. He gives up his very body. Like Christianity is very tactile and, and, and tangible. He gives up his very body to the torture of a cross so that you and I can offer ourselves up to God as a living sacrifice. He takes our place on the cross with his very body. His body crucified for us. His blood shed for us. And God says, this is the purchase price for your hand in marriage. This is the purchase price of redemption for you. This is the ransom payment for your soul. You are decidedly not your own because God has made you and God has bought you back from the dead to be his in your body and in your soul forever. He's bought you with a price in order that you would worship him with your life. That your life, the way that you think, act, feel, and the things that you do with these hands and arms and every part of your body would point to the one who has rescued you and redeemed you from the slavery of sin. And so you are his. And he gives you his spirit to help you accomplish the work he's called you to do. Now, as Christians, with the Spirit, we can use our bodies to do what is most helpful to others, to love them and serve them rather than use them and abuse them. That's what it means to glorify God in the body. Our lives, friends, are no different than theirs. As I thought about application this week, I thought, well, we're just like them. Our danger is to compartmentalize our Christianity too. We've got our little boxes. We give God a box on Sunday. We, we have our times where we hang out with our church friends, and then that's as far as we go. We have our church world, and then we have our, our work world, and then we have our kids' sports worlds, and then these worlds, they just don't really ever touch. There are boxes in your life that are off limits to God. Maybe you don't say that out loud, but that's the way that you live. And when push comes to shove, you don't actually submit your eyes to the Lordship of Christ, and you don't submit your hands to the Lordship of Christ, and you don't submit your body to Him in holiness. You, in function, have submitted to a Corinthian attitude. I have the right to do whatever I want to do with my body. Well, no, you don't. God owns you. God created you, and God knows what's best for you, and he knows what's best, and that is his idea to have deep joy and deep pleasure in the gift of sex through marriage according to his design. To quote Ray Ortland, I quoted this in our Proverbs series when he said, sex is like fire. Inside the fireplace keeps us warm, Outside the fireplace, it burns the whole house down. So don't compartmentalize your life. Second application, I think, is that more so than even the Corinthians, porneia, which is the word here for sexual immorality, where we get pornography from, is all around us. We carry it around with us in our pockets and in our laptop bags. You know, I... I wonder if at the beginning of the sermon, if I had asked the question, sit down if you've looked at pornography in the last three days. How many of us in our hearts would know that we should be sitting down, but maybe not for fear of, you know, embarrassment in front of our, our friends? 
The world that we live in is dominated by sexual immorality. And all of us, to some level, some level or another, have been affected by it. There's no way that you can't be. And Paul says, flee. Don't tolerate it. Don't coddle it like a cute little kitten. It is a viper that will strike when you least expect it. You need to stop flirting with it, and you need to run. And don't just run away in some aimless direction. Run toward the greater promises of God in the gospel, the joy that's found in Jesus. Jesus is better than hookups and pornography and adultery, and the, the, the pleasure of a fleeting moment is trivial compared to the pleasures of God forevermore at his right hand, which he promises us is our inheritance in Christ. It truly is, and it must be to you or you will not be able to resist temptation. If you've given into this sin, which I think probably all of us have on some level, if you've given into this sin, my appeal to you this morning is on the basis of the gospel, don't consign yourself to the dungeon of condemnation. The reason why we sang songs this morning before a passage like this where we sang Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, that he's washed us white as snow, is because we're all sexual sinners and we live under the weight of condemnation and God wants us to turn away from our sin and repentance and find grace in Jesus. This, is, this message is not here to sort of like call you out and beat you up and make you feel lousy about yourself. It's meant to say there's something better for you than you're, that you're missing. So turn from your immorality and turn to Christ. Ask God for the courage to repent. Ask God to help you forsake, forsake what is forbidden. Ask God to give you a desire for his holiness. Ask him to give you a joy in knowing God. And that Holy Spirit which lives inside of you, whom God himself gave you, will do the work. It is a constant battle. So, don't be condemned, but run to the gospel. Use your body to bring worship to God. Use your tongue to say words you won't regret. Use your feet to run to peace, not into violence. Your body is deeply theological. You cannot separate your body from your soul. They're made and designed to stay together. Your body was given to you to worship the Lord. You're joined together with him as a member of his body, and you are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, and you will rise again on the, from the grave on the final day to receive judgment or salvation according to the deeds you do in the body. So the logical conclusion is glorify God. May this, may this message motivate you towards that end. And I pray that as we take communion, as God deals with your heart, there's repentance that will take place and you'll walk out of here pursuing Christ, pursuing joy in him. So let's pray now that God would help us as we come to, to his table. God, your word is so clear. It commands us to flee from what is forbidden because that's not what most glorifies you and that's what's not most helpful for us to flourish. And Lord, we fail at that so often. We, we, we get duped and deceived and we buy the lie and we give in to sexual temptation. And I pray for my fellow brothers and sisters here in the Lord that they would experience Conviction over their sin, but not condemnation. I pray they would experience conviction and the assurance, the assurance of your love. Lord, you know, you knew when you died to save us of every, sins we, every sin we would commit, and you chose to save us anyway. So help us to not hide in shame, Lord, but to come to you and to truly believe the gospel. And I pray, God, that you would make us pure and that we would remember Christ is better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.